good to see some new people here. Too bad it's my last night. But I've got to tell you, today has been amazing. I got off work a little bit early, and I needed it because I don't know about y'all, but when I got home last night, it was about 12.30, and then uh, I tried to go to sleep because I did have to get up at 5, but I was so, I was so jazzed, man, I couldn't do it. I didn't get to sleep till 2.30, and uh, 5 o'clock still came at 5 o'clock, so I had to get up, get the kids ready, and get them off school, then I had to go to work. But I, I found out that I was getting off early, so I was going to be able to come to some place and get something to eat, and I was going to be on time. So uh, I was a Kentucky headhunter this afternoon, and I went to Dumas Walker, and I got it. I went. I said, let's go. So thank you for that, ma'am. Thank you. I mean, but not only that, afterwards, I went back, and I told you last night after the service, I was, I was really, really jazzed. I really was. I was just, I was pumped. I was ready to, I was ready to fight through hell with water pistols last night. And uh, I got to thinking, I was like, man, I got a good message for tomorrow. But I don't think it's the message that I need to preach. So I was telling Miss Darlene, I was like, I've got to, she's like, you need to go take a nap. I was like, I can't. I've got a message to write. And uh, I went over after I eat, went to the Airbnb that was graciously provided to me. Thank you. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. I fell asleep. And uh, I woke up and I started writing this sermon. I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't have it on paper. And uh, I want to share that with you tonight. So this is our last evening together. And I'm going to do it again. Right? So Sunday night, I was asked before I did this, what's your theme? What are you doing? What's the purpose in this? And I always said it was to share Christ to share Jesus to whoever wanted to listen to it, believer, non-believer. And I don't know if I've done that, but if last night is any meter on that, I believe I have a little bit. God showed up last night. Amen? Amen. And uh, I don't know if y'all realize this, but I, I preached for an hour and a half, and it was great. <laughs> Well, you just don't listen. <laughs> so, so, amen. amen. <laughs> so, I get this message done, and and I want to I want to present it. But like I said, everybody was asking, "What's your theme? What's your theme? What are you doing?" And I finally figured out what the theme of these entire four days has been. It's been building up to tonight. So Sunday. When we start it, I'm going to test your, I'm going to test your recollection. So Sunday, when we start it, we ask a great question, or we answered a great question, and that was, "Who do you say that I am?" And then the greatest que the greatest answer that we as humans will ever hear is what Christ says about us when we come to Him in like-minded faith, when we come to Him on our belief, when we are baptized and when we give our life over to him we find out our identity in Christ and we hear him say you are mine and then Monday night we extended that why should we be so special among all of God's creation that we should be able to be called his very own children and we found that out. Anybody remember the Hebrew word? Neshamacha. His very breath is what he breathed into all of mankind, giving them a living soul. And then last night, man, it hit. As we talked about the teaching of the ten virgins and how those ten virgins were already believers and 
uh, some were foolish because they, they hadn't been ready and, and they, were, they were going on the faith of others, but they hadn't prepared themselves. And then you had five more virgins who were believers as well. And they had prepared. So last night's message was, are you ready? But we talked about this readiness and we explained it a little bit. And then at the very end of it, I don't know if anybody caught it, but it, it says that those virgins that were ready, the bridegroom took and ushered them in into the Father's house and shut the door. And the wedding feast began. And I got to, with, with what was moving last night, I just had to prepare this. So I want to talk about that tonight. What is the wedding feast? What, what does this mean? How special are we to Jesus? And do we see Jesus' proposal while he was alive? You know, I'm a... Uh, it's really hard for me. I told you last night or a couple nights ago that I really got my, I cut my teeth and I, I learned how to walk and I scraped my knees and my ankles in men's ministry, right? But we hear all the time, uh, Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is his bride, and oh, how he loves us. And he does, right? Worst song ever written, David Crowder. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane, and I am the tree. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a man. I, I, don't, I don't understand Jesus as my boyfriend. I just can't do it. So I really wanted to know, what, what is all about this marriage deal? Why such the imagery on marriage? And I think I may have found just a little piece of it, uh, as my friend Tanner Dalton is getting married this Saturday, and sadly I'm not going to be able to be there, I wanted to look at this, and I wanted to study it a little bit more, and I found out some very, very interesting stuff, okay? First night we did baptism. Well, I wish we was doing baptism. First night we did communion. Tonight we're going to do communion as well, but I'm going to challenge you during this communion. You see, because I think there is beautiful, beautiful imagery that can be found right here in this book and uh, of what everything is going to be. Everybody got their Bibles? This is the very Word of God. In it, we find hope. Through it, we find a light that will guide us in the darkness until we meet our Creator. And through its author, we'll find hope. But let's open it together, shall we? We'll be turning into Matthew chapter 25. So while I'm preparing, uh, go ahead and tune in or turn on your Bible. Turn in or turn on your Bible. Yeah, that's what it is. And I, I wanted to tell you a little something because... This whole imagery of the bridegroom, I, I really don't get. And I know that some preachers try to explain it, and they'll have a sermon where they come out and they'll say, Dearly beloved, we're gathered here today amongst like-minded individuals, blah, blah, whatever. But I want to tell you something. There's, there's something different about a Middle Eastern wedding. Okay? We, in our American Americanized eyes, we want to view this Bible through our lens. Anybody know who this was written to? The Jewish people. It was written to us as well. However, we can't insert 2023 American thinking into this book. We have to challenge ourselves to, to jump back 2,000 2,500 years ago and beyond to really grasp some of the imagery in here. When Jesus taught these parables, last night he taught about the lamp, right? The oil lamp. I know a few of you had oil lamps. There were some that didn't, so I had to switch that up. 
and I had to change that, that Jewish mindset of what an oil lamp is, and I had to bring it to today with the, the imagery of a car, with gasoline. And it's no different with, with these weddings. We have a certain mindset of how weddings are and how weddings are conducted, but a Galilean wedding was the biggest event that would take place for the entire region, the entire village. And when word would spread about an engagement, everyone, everyone from the city would meet at the gate of that city where the elders would witness and establish the covenant between these parties involved. You see, it, 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 it wasn't just individuals that were friends of the family, right? You didn't just send out invites to uh, Robbie's family because his daughter is, is, is his daughter. And I wouldn't just send them out to my side of the family because my son is my son. This was an entire thing. It wasn't just friends. It wasn't just family. It was that they needed to have witnesses of what was about to take place. And they had to do this at the city gates of the, of the town that they lived in, in these areas of Galilee. Because without the establishment of witnesses, a covenant was, non, was non-valid. It, it, it held no weight whatsoever. We still do that in our traditional wedding, right? You've got to have a witness for the bride. You've got to have a witness for the groom. But in the biblical time, you had to have at least three. And even more so with a covenant of this magnitude. You see, a written proposal or a covenant would be presented by the father of the groom to the bride for her approval. Nowhere else in the entire Middle East, even to this day, does weddings as special and as intricate as a Galilean wedding. And it just blew me away when I started researching this. And Robbie and I have talked about it a little bit, but it was the father of the groom who wrote a specific covenant for the bride's approval. Okay? When we think about it, I feel like my son will one day propose to this one. Well, maybe not. She's rolling her eyes. So he'll get down on one knee. He'll probably ask Robbie his permission. But here we see it's the father of the groom who dictates all of the terms of the, of the proposal that's getting ready to take place. And this was to assure that there was no fine print so that the acceptor of this covenant would not be able to return after a while and say, "Um, hold on, I I didn't know everything that I was getting into. right?" They can't come back and say that they were unaware of the terms of this covenant. And friends, family, I want to tell you, it's the same with our term of covenant with God. All throughout the Bible, we see that it is God alone who establishes covenant with his people. Many people today try, my, okay, I didn't go. All right, many people today in this world try to make an appeal to God as if they were the ones that could dictate anything to the creator, God. Well, God, if you do this, I'll do that. Well, if you're, if you're really real, then you will show yourself to me. How arrogant is that for the creation to make demands of their creator? And I'm, I'm not saying it because I, I, let's be honest, I used to do it, right? Back when I was uh, not, a, not a Christian, I was a Christian, but I wasn't, are you laughing at me back there? Back when I was a Christian, there was plenty of times that I pleaded with God. God, if you would make this room quit spinning, I promise you I will not do this again. 
But come to find out, I wasn't praying to the God of all the universe. I was praying to the porcelain God and all its nastiness. But it is God alone that is able to establish a covenant with his people. And it is by his holy righteousness, he is the only one that can issue and establish the terms of said covenant. It's not a two-way street with God. He establishes the terms, you follow the terms, or you break the covenant with him. Now, through his grace, through his mercy, and his loving kindness, he knows that we're going to mess up. That's why he sent his son. You see, this is called a unilateral covenant. It's as if me and Robbie were to meet into a covenant, right? And Robbie made all of the terms. He made the APR, or what the interest was going to be, and everything like that. And I could either accept it, or I can reject it. Because I have nothing to offer Robbie. We have nothing to offer God. Because it wasn't God that broke the first covenant in the garden. But after reading this covenant, we're going back. I want you to... You don't have to close your eyes, but just imagine with me, right? You've got a small Galilean city. You can smell the goat poop, and you can smell the cattle, and you can smell the camels, and it's all dusty everywhere. And you've got these, these small stone huts where these families would live. And you've got the entire city meeting at the front gate with these at least three old guys, the elders, because they're the ones that dictated the terms of law in that area. Can you smell that? Can you smell that dirt? Can you see it? Can you visualize the heat? The I know that I can because it's hot tonight. I can visualize the sweat coming off my brow. So after, after the father of the groom would present this covenant to the bride... I want you to remember that, to the bride. No one else, to the bride. So after he would read this covenant, there would be an exchanging of gifts to the bride, okay? Not the groom. The bride would then be presented with a dowry. Not the groom. In most Middle Eastern cultures, it's the other way around. The family of the bride has to save up and save up and offer this gift of dowry to the father of the groom. But it's completely backwards right here. And it's backward from any other Middle Eastern culture and wedding still to this day. You could say this was uh, kind of an insurance policy, right? This dowry that the groom would present to his future bride that he got from his father as a way of ensuring that if something happened to the groom, that the bride would be set free from the covenant for one, right? But then she would be taken care of. She wouldn't leave in shame. She would hold her honor. And it also protected her in the event that the groom did something that he shouldn't have done and had to recant from his betrothal. But I want you to listen to this because what happens next, it's amazing. It is the bride and only the bride, not the bride's mama, not the bride's daddy, the bride who is only able to accept this offer of marriage to the son of the father. Ain't, ain't that, am I captivating you that much? I mean, does that, is that resonating anything with you right now? It was Jesus of Gal, La, thank you very much. This is a Galilean wedding. Okay? I'm just trying to get some connect the dots going on here. Okay? But what you, just wait, there's more like infomercial. And what's going to happen next, you're going to see some similarities, okay? 
after reading the covenant, the exchanging of the gifts by the, from the father to the son, from the son to his bride, potential bride, he then takes bread. Okay? He separates or breaks the bread and he gives it to his bride. And in doing so, it signifies him as giving himself to her alone and saying that he was willing to break his body on her behalf. Then the groom was given a cup. Not just any cup. A special cup. It's called the cup of joy. And he was presented this cup from his father. Okay? And then the groom would take wine and he would pour it into the cup. And then he would turn back to his father and he would ask his father to bless the union that was about ready to take place. <coughs> and he hands that wine filled cup to his future bride. And bear in mind that, once again, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm trying to beat this into your head a little bit. It is the bride alone at this point that has the power to either accept or reject. It's time for my kids to brush their teeth. I'm sorry. It is the bride and the bride alone that can accept or reject this proposal of marriage. Okay? Then and only then. Then and only when the bride actually accepts this covenantal offer, the bridegroom tells her after she drinks it, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew with you in my father's house. Sound familiar? Getting cold chills yet? I am. And I've been researching this stuff. We too, we too, I think we've talked about this the past three days, but it begs to be told yet again, we too alone have the power to accept or reject the proposal of Christ. And we must accept it for ourselves. Nobody else can do it. You are the bride of Christ. Only you can accept or reject this proposal. The bridegroom doesn't make us, but he leaves us the choice. And by this breaking of bread and offering of wine, it becomes the signifying event that will join them into a common union. Squeeze those words together real quick. Communion. Common union. They, became, they could become one flesh right then. Wow. Wow. Do you see any similarities to do anything that we do every Sunday? Do you maybe see a little bit of why Jesus said, Remember me at the Last Supper? Like I said, we're getting ready to do communion. And I'm telling you all this because I want you to just visualize it. We sometimes view communion only as something we do and not something that we are a part of. And it saddens me. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is is my body, which is for you, broken on your behalf. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, 
For whenever you drink this bread or eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And I'm sorry, I get a little bit hype on this. I love my Christian brothers and sisters in the church of Christ. But sometimes we are just so afraid to talk about that. Because we don't want to be called the charismatics. I holler at people going down the street while I'm preaching. A little bit more charismatic. It comes from my mom's side. I'm sorry. We seemingly view it not as a promise of his return, but we treat it simply as snack time with Jesus. And I can't stand for it anymore. I won't. And it's good to note that all of Jesus' disciples were also from the area of Galilee, except for one. Anybody want to take a guess who that one is? Judas. The only one. But it's even recorded in church history that Matthias, who took Judas' place, was a Galilean himself. So I need you to understand this, that they would have completely understood what was happening at the Last Supper. He was building a new covenant. Jesus Christ was saying this old way, that's not the way anymore. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And I'm offering you this covenant. They would have completely understood it. They would have no doubt understood this wedding imagery that, would, that would, be, would have been at the forefront of their mind every single time they took communion. Y'all ready to have snack time with Jesus? Or y'all ready to break into a new covenant and remember our Lord until he returns? So if you're able to, if you're not, that's fine. Robbie, can you and Levi come up here, please? Or Steve, it doesn't matter, whoever. What I'd like to do, if you two will stand over here, don't push. There's enough Jesus for everybody. Y'all grab, grab the emblems right there, please. If you would come up and you would, you would take a piece of bread. Those are big chunks, dude. We just sit there and, Steve, you'll have to break that in half. There you go. Just come up here. Y'all stand over here, please, so everybody don't have to go all the way around. And just single file the best that you can. If you can't get up, that's fine. We will serve you. But I want you to take this communion in such a way that it's not snack time with Jesus. It is a picture of his covenant with us, and we do this in remembrance of him. Let me give you half of that. Can I have half again? I could probably do half again. There you go, brother. Thank you, brother. I want you to take the bread, okay? That's all right. There's, there's plenty more. more. There's plenty more body for you. Take a piece of the bread, and I want you to come, and I want you to, to dip it into, it's not wine, but I want you to take it back, and that's great. Just like that, I want you to take it back, and I want you to understand that in doing so, yeah, okay. dip it, dip it, dip it, dip cool. it. Uh, hold on to it. Okay. On. You're good. You're good. And if you take it, that's fine. It's great. But I don't want you to just pop it in your mouth like it's popcorn shrimp. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I want you to really think about this think about it. for a moment. About what this is every single Sunday. A lot of churches want to complain about us and they say, the Christian church does it every Sunday and they've made a tradition out of it. And in a way, I think they might be right. But if we look at it from the eyes of what it means, we can truly remember our Savior until His return. Because there's going to come a time when we will not be taking this communion anymore. Because He will have returned and we will be in the wedding feast with him <laughs> oh, 
as y'all are doing this, I'm, I'm going to continue because I've got to be honest. I, I tried to stop myself, but I just kept on trucking. Whenever you're ready, we, we don't have to do it together, okay? This is, this is your personal time. You are the bride of Christ. So you determine right now if you will accept his covenantal promise or if you wanted to, if you wanted to just push it away. Either way, it's fine. But it's, it's you. It's you. Check this out. Look. Dip. This was not. I couldn't find none in the county. Yeah, the original would be. Now, I will tell you that I have, I have an idea for doing communion, but most churches would run me out. I want to do, hear me out, okay? I told you, started in men's ministry, we do stuff weird. Natural grape soda and Cheez-Its. That is unleavened, and it is... It's biblical. It's scriptural. Cheez Its are unleavened. And they are kosher. Maybe that's something that you could take back to your churches and do on Father's Day. But regardless, when you go back to your church this Sunday and you do communion, think about tonight. Think about this little moment and what it is and why we do it. So now, hopefully, everyone's accepted. Christ okay but just like the bride after the acceptance of the offering from the bridegroom the betrothal period started right then but again it's not like anything that that we would understand right I got to pick on Rose even because she's she's not even said hi to me all night why because her beloved is in here is what I think I don't know no <laughs> I'm the father of the bridegroom. She better like me after this. Okay? Okay? So 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 typically when two individuals get engaged, right? They still see each other. Some in the world, they they will go ahead and they will move in together and then they will start picking stuff out together. The the guy says that he's helping, but let's be honest, guys. Let's tell, them the, let's tell them the secret. We go ahead and we just mess it up so that they will take care of it in the long run, right? Because it's going to be, we're going to be in trouble anyway because it's not going to be what they want. But it's different here, okay? During this betrothal period, neither the bride nor the bridegroom will see each other. They can only anticipate their reunion. The bridegroom goes away from his betrothed and prepares a place for them in his father's house for them to begin their lives together. This could be an additional room onto the father's house or it could be another building on the father's land. It doesn't really matter. It's kind of up to the, the bridegroom. And I've got, I'm going to be honest. If y'all try to build a, a room onto my house, it's not happening because I'm not letting it. You see? But see, it, it was at the Last Supper Jesus told his disciples after he broke the bread and he passed the wine. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in, my, in me. In my Father's house, there's many rooms, and if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. And I'm going, to, to, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If it were not true, I would not have said so. Again, Galilean, the imagery, the beauty. So the bridegroom would go away. He would go back to his father's house. He would get wood and nails, all of the construction materials that he needed while still building up money for them to have the wedding uh, and, and to money to start their life with. He would, still, he would have to get the furnishings and he would begin to build their future. Now the bride, she would prepare her, her, her groom's, she would prepare for her groom's return. 
And she does the same. She prepares for him to return to her. She stays vigilant. She stays ready for the wedding feast that's to take place at the house of the bridegroom's father. Typically, it took about a year, right? It took about a year for the bridegroom to gather, build the materials, and for the, for the bride to, to gather all of the uh, uh, fabrics, all of the jewels, for not just herself, but her, her bridesmaids. Okay? And while she does that, she stays vigilant and ready for the return of the bridegroom. But neither the bride nor the groom knew the day or the hour and when the groom of the time when the groom would return for his bride. Does that sound familiar? Talked about it last night. Permission for the bridegroom's return. This is going to blow your mind. Permission for the bridegroom's return is given by no one other than the Father himself. The Father of the bridegroom is the one that gives permission. And only the Father of the bridegroom knew the time. Not the son, not the bride, not the father's wife. No one but the Father knew when he would send his son back to get his bride. And it, it kind of makes sense because I think about, again, Rose and my son. I don't know, though. You're getting kind of, it might be over. I don't know. I, I think about my son, and I know my son. When he gets married or when he gets engaged, He's going he's gonna to want, if he's got to build, build whatever, if my son had to build something, it's going to be the crappiest thing that you've ever seen in your life. He might use uh, finishing nails to try to put the, the studs together. Nails aren't going through two before that away, and everything's going to fall. But he wants to get done so he can get to his bride. So I get it. The, bri the, the father is just being diligent and making sure that his son is preparing properly for the bride that is to come. You see, this is what sets apart a Galilean wedding from any other wedding ceremony in the Middle East, even to this day. But the disciples also asked Jesus, what day or hour? But he told them, of that day and hour no one knows, not the angels in heaven or the Son but only the Father. So can you imagine the anticipation that built up day after day, hour after hour for the bridegroom to return to his bride? Can you imagine the anticipation of the bride for the return of her groom? Do we do that as a church? Can we honestly say that? We want to say, oh, the Lord's going to take it one day. He's going to come back and he's going to, he's going to take us away from all this stuff. But don't let it be tomorrow because I've got something going on. It's not what the disciples in here, that's all they talked about. They thought that Jesus was coming back that day. And if not that day, the next day or the next day. I think we've fallen asleep as a church. I'm not saying that we're foolish, but I'm not saying that we're wise either. We've just fallen asleep, and I don't know if we're prepared for his return. But once the father gave word to the son to go retrieve his bride, the son would set out along the way. Okay? And it would start out with him and his groomsmen. And then they would start walking all the way through the city, and slowly but surely, people would hear what was going on, and they would hear this chatter, and every time they would say, there would be some scouts that would go before them, and they would say, just like what we heard last night, get up, arise, for the bridegroom is returning. Come out and meet him. 
that was really to make sure that Sister Sue Harris, the bride, didn't have curlers on that night. And if she did, she could go ahead and take them out and get decently ready. Okay? But this procession would get greater and greater, and the anticipation would build of the wedding feast and the festivities that were going to take place. And the beauty of this is that no matter when the father give his blessing for the son to go get her, it was typically at the middle of the night when they wouldn't be ready. And just like the ten virgins we talked about last night, as soon as the bride heard this, she would have to get up and she would have to trim her wick, and she better make sure she's got enough light. Because if she's got to go get light, she's got to go get oil for the light. We talked about it last night. What happens? In doing this, he would understand that all the preparation during the entirety of the betrothal would have not been in vain. No matter the day or the time, the father wants to know and see that the son only had to get up and he only had to go. And in return, he only hoped that the bride was just as prepared with the same intentness. He has watched his son labor. He has watched his son prepare for this day. He's watched him suffer. He's watched him sweat. He's watched him bleed in anticipation. And now his son was ready to get his bride. But was the bride? The bridegroom's father could only hope she was. And it wasn't until that processional arrived and the bride heard the commotion. Arise, the bridegroom has arrived. Come out and meet him. If she had diligently prepared, she would be lifted up by the bridegroom. I know we've all seen it on YouTube at bar mitzvahs and stuff. They lift, they lift them up, right? And they, uh, whatever. I can't think of what it is. And they would be carried away to the Father's house where the celebration would begin. And if not, then the procession, if the bride wasn't ready, the procession would stop and they would return back to the father's house. And that bride wouldn't be welcomed into, to enter the feast. And she would, she would more than likely be ostracized by not only the father's family, but the entire community. Because remember, the entire community was publicly there when she accepted the terms of the covenant. So my question to you is the same as it was last night. Have we, as the bride of Christ, prepared in such a way as to be prepared for the return of the bridegroom? Are you personally prepared for the wedding feast to come? But you say, Michael, what is this feast that we keep talking about? Therein lies where my sermon starts. All that was building up to this. So if you'll turn in or turn on your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. If you don't have one, that's fine. I'll read it to you. I'll be reading out the ESV version or the NASV version. Jesus spoke to him again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Huh. A father giving a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. And then again, he, he sent them out again. And he said, this time tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But again, they paid no attention and they went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and he destroyed those murderers and set the city on fire. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go. Go to the main highways 
as many as you find there and bite them to the wedding feast. And those slaves, those slaves went into the streets and they gathered together all that they found, both good and evil, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man. And that man was there, not dressed in the wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how do you come in here with that wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And then the king said to his servants, bind him up, hand him foot, throw him into the outer darkness, into the place where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited few are chosen. We talked about that last night too. Outside when the door was shut, there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And those ten foolish virgins that weren't ready, they cried out, Lord, Lord, let us in. But as we heard the greatest answer that we'll ever hear, last night we found out what the worst any human will ever hear. Depart from me. I never knew you. And you see, in this Middle Eastern culture, there were two invitations expected when a banquet was to take place. The first one, ask a guest to attend, right? I'm giving Robbie. Levi is my slave. Tell him to come and tell him to come. We're going to have a wedding feast, right? And if Robbie accepts that, he's going to get a second one. And then this one's going to say, the feast is ready. Come on, as quick as you can get there. But in this parable of the wedding feast, the king invited his guests three times. And each time they rejected his invitation. God so wants his most important creation to join him at his banquet which will last for eternity. And that's why throughout our lives he sends us invitation after invitation after invitation to join into this feast, to accept his invitation that he has sent to you because right now it's not ready. The invitation is still open. Have you accepted it? Have you thought about it? There's a lot of people around and say, I accepted the invitation. But they really haven't. Because they haven't been taught to understand what it meant. Who the king is that they're going to see. Verses 11 and 13 seem pretty harsh. So I'm going to read them again. Starting in verse 11. I don't went across. There we go. But when the king came and saw the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing the wedding clothes. Friend, how'd you get in here without your wedding clothes? That's not the King James Version. That's the, that's the hillbilly Michael Version. What are you doing in here? You ain't got the traditional shirt that I give out to everybody. And the, the man was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, tie him up, hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This guy comes to the wedding, but he wasn't wearing the ceremonial garments that were given. And again, our, our, our Western minds don't understand what this is, what this means. But I was working with a guy up at the granary. I just met him, and, and he's become a fast friend. He's, he's a Christian, right? But we're working on him. He knows Jesus, but he don't know Jesus. But we're working on him. And for, for whatever reason, it come up. And he told me that he was invited to one of his college friend's weddings that just so happened to be in India. Right? So he goes to India with his friend. 
and and they they do the typical bachelor things in India. They they go out and they're having a good time, and then the day of the wedding comes. Now he's not Indian. He's white as me. White as he's just white. So they they told him that he didn't have to wear the traditional garments of the wedding. I don't know if you've ever seen a an Indian wedding, but it's I mean it's beautiful. There's colors. It's not drab at all. I mean it is it is very hey girl, you know what I mean? With the colors. But he 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 accepted because he was in the wedding. So they give him a special garment, one that nobody else in the the entire wedding had. It was a solid gold suit. It, it shined. It wasn't gold, so it wasn't metal. But it was beautiful. And I said, well, well why did they give you a special outfit for this wedding when you could have just wore a tux? He's like, no, 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 no. I was his best man. So I was an honored guest at his wedding. I sat at the table with him and his wife at their wedding feast. And that's what's going on here. At a Middle Eastern wedding, you're going to be expected to wear a nice garment that is provided by you, provided to you by the father of the bridegroom. And it's not that this guy in the scriptures wasn't offered the gown. Right? Because we know that you can't get into the Father's house without the gown. Without the ceremonial robes. He just simply chose not to wear them. And in doing so, he insulted his host. And in the eyes of the host, he can only assume that this guest was just so arrogant that he thought he didn't need the garments. He thought he was better, and he didn't want to take part in this wedding celebration itself. These wedding clothes, these are a representation. These are just an illustration of the righteousness, the robes of righteousness that are needed to enter into God's kingdom and total acceptance in the eyes of God through Christ given to every believer. And like the wedding host in my friend's wedding, Christ supplies the garments of righteousness for everyone. But each person must choose for themselves to either put on this righteousness and enter into the king's banquet or to step back. I'm not wearing those. And again, that choice is ours. If nothing else, I think we've got that now. The wedding feast itself, that is eternal life everlasting. The psalmist writes in Psalm 132, her priest also, I will clothe with salvation and her godly ones will sing aloud for joy. Isaiah writes in his 61st chapter, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness, and as bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns jewels, she adorns herself with jewels. It's written in the third chapter of Zechariah. Now Joseph was clothed with filthy rags. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And standing before the angel, he spoke. And he said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with a, with a festal robe. Let them put a clean turban on his head so they can put a clean turban on his head and clothe him 
with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And then again in Revelation 3. You all right, brother? All right. Revelation 3, starting in verse 4. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in the white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So let us go forth and rejoice. Let us therefore rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine, bright linen, clean. For the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. Don't you see it? Have we been sitting blind for all this time and we're not able to see? Be ready. As we've learned these past few days, it's knowing that we are dressed appropriately. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect because we won't be. But through the waters, we are made new. And we are dressed in His righteousness. Mark Frost writes a poem. And I got this little snippet of a poem from Dr. Cottrell. But Mark Frost was a, uh, a student at Cincinnati. And he wrote this poem. It's called, I Wear the Lord's Robes of Righteousness. And it says, My good works are nothing but filthy rags made up of burlap bags fit just for a sleazy hag full of smells on which everybody gags. But I wear the Lord's righteous robes. You see, even though that we're in the muck and the mire and we've got to wear deodorant and sometimes put deodorant or put cologne on, sometimes too much cologne, even though we are dressed in this filthy rag, this tent that is rained on, this tent that is, that is hardened by the cold air and the wind that blows across our hands, this filthy tent that has to manually break itself just to survive. For the believer is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. If we accept the covenant proposal, and I ask you tonight, brothers and sisters, have you fully accepted this invitation? Have you put on the righteousness of Christ, being clothed by Him through baptism? John writes in Revelation, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are true words of God. John also reminds us to remember what you have received and what you have heard and to keep it and repent. That tells us right there that we're, not, we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to be perfect. Because if we ever able to remember what we've received, if we're able to remember what we have heard and we have kept it, then why do we have to repent? Because we're going to make mistakes. The difference in re true repentance, a repentant heart and a heart Rebellion, as I'll just make it real simple for you. If I go out and I steal anything, right? You work at Sonic? These are the best things ever. Frozen cherry lime made from Sonic. I, I drink at least one of these a day. I have all through summer. I've called it the, the summer of Slurpee. If I was to get one of these and I was able, because I ordered through the app, because you can get them half price, okay? Shameless plug, just for you. If I was able to trick the app so that it said that I paid already, okay? And I was able to get free frozen cherry limeade with an extra shot of cherry for free. 
I would be stealing. If I said, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me for I've stolen this and I need, I, I need to repent and I need, I need to come back to you and, and I need you to take this from me. If that was the end of it, then fine. But if I said all that and then the next day, I was like, man, I need this frozen cherry limeade with an extra shot of cherry flavor. I don't have any money. But ah, I've got the app. And I went right back and I did it again. And then I was like, you know, Lord, I, I just really had a bad day. I, I, had, to, I had to get one. I, I just had to get another one. I, I'm not going to do it again. And then the next day happens, and it continues. And then you repent. It's wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. It doesn't mean that I'm going to mess up, or it doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect and never use the flawed app that I just created, which quite honestly would be pretty cool. A repentant heart is turning away from the sin. Doesn't mean we won't mess up. But a rebellious heart is one that continues to live in this lifestyle of sin. Making, making Jesus Christ be crucified on the cross every single time when all it took was once. I'm sorry, I got off track there. I didn't mean to. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. Let's just start that one over. John reminds us in Revelation 3. Remember what you've received and what you've heard. Keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come to you. Far too many Christians are asleep today. And I'm not going to call you out for it because, like I said in the first night, I'm on my own journey. But if you come to me and you tell me, Michael, I'm having some issues. Can you help me? I will be more than happy to hold you accountable. But I think there's far too many who are living in this false sense of reality that they are blessedly assured. But they have, they have lied to themselves. They have been in lustful complacency and they are held in captivity. And they do not know Jesus no more than Robbie knows the President of the United States. Personally. I really hope you don't. Because that would be a bad metaphor if you really did. But the time's now. We've learned over the past four days who Jesus is, who we are to Jesus, why we are so precious to Jesus. We learned the implications that we can be, we can be tricked. We can be believers and, and still rely on other people to, to hold our faith together, to make us look good. We rely on their oil, but we found out last night that we, there's going to come a time we can't do that. And then we find out tonight that if we're not ready, we can't go into this wedding feast. We learned last night that, that Jesus is the one that holds the key of David. The one who can open and no one can shut. The one who shuts and no one can open. I pray for each and every one of you that you will take this back to your congregation. I think most of you come here, right? So I really hope you bring it back to your congregation. And you act on what you've learned this week. Because I know that I, I can't go back to uh, ministering and, and, and doing fill-in preaching and not have this heart myself. So if you have, if you have a decision to make, or, or like last night, there's just something that's just, eating you and you've, you've just got to get off your chest I think last night proved that that this is a safe place this is a place of love and honor this is a place where the shame that you feel 
is not shame anymore because Jesus didn't shame individuals. Jesus picked them up where they were at. He met them in their shame and he lifted them to a place of honor. We like to think in the United States that the one who has the most money has the most power, who has the most prestige, who is better off. But in the Middle Eastern culture, it's the complete opposite. We think horizontally. They think vertically. vertically. And every individual that Jesus Christ encountered in the Bible, he picked them up in their shame, which is the lower rung of the social status in Middle East culture. And he lifted them up to a place of honor. And if you are sitting in that shame tonight, Christ will lift you up. And re give you that honor. He will glorify you because He is glorified and He will give you that robe of righteousness. So I'm going to pray and then Robbie's going to do his thing. And then before we end, I, I want to just say thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you got just as much out of it as I have. But Father, we come to you humbly because we are. We're nothing without you. But you are so gracious that you would step into your own creation, that you would send the bridegroom, and he would choose us to call us his own. He would give us, he would give us of himself, and then he would say that I will return for you one day. I'm building the place. Father, I pray that these individuals would just accept that. Be with us as we go home. Be with us over the next course, the course of the next couple of weeks when the, the energy of this revival has, has lapsed. And let us not go back to a space to where we, we sit in our comfort and our contentment and we allow church to be the same. But may it be enhanced in you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.